I'm uh, Agustin Calatroni and I work, I'm a statistician working on the asthma group. And uh, 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 over the years, we have uh, worked a lot on visualization, especially to uh, communicate with the investigators. Uh, we collect a, a lot of data, and it is important uh, to make that data, uh, disclose that data to them, like that they we get a feedback communication. We communicate the statistical results, and they can bring us a little bit the clinical ideas that sometimes uh, 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 improve our statistical analysis. So I have put together a little bit here a presentation about some of the work we have done. And towards the end, if you want to learn more, I have a little bit some uh, details of what, you, what I think is a good place uh, to go next. Uh, I think we all understand the importance of graphics. And uh, I think it is important to know that when you look at raw data, uh, it's difficult to see the, the larger picture without a graphic. I think this figure illustrates that well. The confidence interval here or the standard error is very large. What it makes that probably there is very few observations there. So this guy says, sorry, I can't trust you. And uh, then uh, uh, this is another example of why graphics are important. This is a very famous paper in 1973, in which you have uh, a, a four data sets. The four data sets have absolutely the same distribution. They have the same marginals. They have the same uh, a, a intercept, the same slopes. But as you can see, each of these pictures shows something different. And if you would have not made a graph, probably you would have a, made made a mistake. You know, this is the perfect fit. This is a quadratic fit. This is probably an outlier. And this is a problem with levels of detections. So this is, again, very famous data set just to show maybe why graphics are, uh, in our opinion, so important. Before we get to graphics, and this is maybe my, uh, my years of experience doing statistics, I think it's very important that before we even get to any statistical analysis or anything, we really look at the data carefully. There is often mistakes that you can catch up very early. So that's why we have developed what we call a code book, in which is a very succinct way of learning about your data, each univariate distribution. Uh, and it prints, I show you a Zoom a picture in the next slide, but it prints what I think is nicely. You know, this is a proc univariate, if you will. It's not proc univariate, but it's the same as proc univariate. But it has a little bit of some uh, uh, intelligence in the sense that it can capture data that is categorical, data that is continuous, and each one gets printed accordingly. Let me give you an example. Here we have a data set in which we have uh, IDs, age, sex, race, service, and uh, systolic blood pressure. And uh, each uh, variable prints the variable name and the variable label. And then you have the, the N, the number missing, and the unique. This is very important when you work with IDs, because if you are not expecting to have a duplicate ID, and here you have unique 199, you know there is a duplicate ID. And you, you right now know that you need to go back to the data set and figure out why that happened. And then it prints the mean, the standard deviation, some distribution here, and then a very nice, in my opinion, actually, a very nice histogram. You don't need all the details of the histogram. You need to know if there is an observation that is really far left or far right to be a problem. When I started statistics, uh, my a professor used to tell me there is two types of outliers. There is the outlier, and there is the outright liar. You want to pick up the outright liar, because that one is going to jeopardize your statistical analysis. And then, a, a gender, here, here you have sex, the label for sex is sex, that's quite descriptive, and then you have a format. And the format here gives, you know, generally we call gender one and two or zero and one, and the format already gives, you know, 
you print, you print without a format, you don't know zero is male, zero is female, what it is. And this brings the format in and print a little bit of uh, frequency. So now you are able to see how many males and how many females you have. And uh, uh, then it goes through the whole data set. Uh, it, sometimes importantly is to know the number of missings. And in our work, we code a lot of dot missing codes, like they are calling us. Because, you know, sometimes we have missing because the person was, didn't show up. Sometimes we have missing because the tube fell. Different. And then we bring those dot code missings into the printout to be able to know exactly why those were missing. This is very simple. This uh, is an exaggeration to say that this system is a little bit intelligent, but nobody has it, you know? I mean, why is it, you know? And then when you do a proc univariate, you, have you can only do continuous. It may bump with uh, characters. So this prints in a nice format uh, a, a SAS data set. Uh, this is work that we have done with Herman and myself. We did this in 2007 in a Society of Clinical Trial posters. And if you want the details, the details are in the poster, and it shows you the steps that we go through from a SAS data set into a PDF report. And it gives all the details. And we have enhanced it a little bit, but the engine remains the same. And you will tell me, well, that's fancy. That's very complicated. In fact, if it was fancy and complicated, it will be unuseful. So it's very simple and uncomplicated. What you do is these five lines of code. These five lines of codes give you uh, uh, the PDF output. So you tell where the macro lives. You tell the two, uh, two, uh, two name uh, convention in SAS. You tell where the formats live. You tell what the, uh, how do you want to call the PDF and where you want to save the PDF. And then it has a ton of options. You know, you want the, your data set be uh, sorted out alphabetically. You can do that. You want it sort out by the order in which SAS lives. You can do that. So we are deploying this publicly. It's almost done. And uh, we have found it uh, uh, very, very useful in our own work. So now that I show you, and I think my point of that is saying, you know, the graphics, the analysis depend on the data. So I really wanted to highlight the importance of the data. But now that I have shown you that, I really want to go through examples of uh, data sets and analysis we have done and how we have used graphics to enhance those analysis. Hence the little joke here. The first example I'm going to give you is an example that we use just because it's very simple, you know, and the example comes from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It's the world's largest ongoing telephone health survey in the world, and it tracks the conditions and risk behaviors of the United States since 1984. And uh, the data is collected in 50 states and some non-states. I left those out. And for this example, what we are going to do is we're going to work with data from 2000 to 2011, and uh, we are going to work with a variable in particular that is prevalence of adults currently asthmatic. And further information, I put the link for the data set. This is a very nice data set. This is uh, publicly available. There is a lot of data. It's very well done. I think each year there is more than 70,000 participants and is, uh, is done in, uh, within the survey. So it's representative to the United States population. So this is what we all see all the time, OK? A very large and ugly table, you know? I'm going to tell you what the table uh, has. You know, it has the states on the top, the 50 American uh, US states, and uh, starting from Alabama and finishing in Wyoming. And then it has the years, you know? And throughout these numbers, these little numbers here, you have the prevalence. And we ask the investigator to make sense of this data, you know? And Maybe they can, maybe they cannot. So since I cannot make sense of the data, I move on into translating this data into figures and seeing what the data is telling us. I want to highlight here something that is very well known in the statistical literature and in the literature of, of graphics. It's called the Alabama fallacy. 
is the idea that you always have to order things alphabetically. And this obviously has, some people call it the Alabama-Wyoming fallacy because things should start with Alabama and should finish with Wyoming, you know, and that literally rarely makes sense. So what we're going to do here, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to color code the cells. So we color code the cells by the prevalence. These are uh, quintiles, I think. And uh, what you can see is I color coded the cells. And now, although it's still a big table, it's still hard to read, it's still hard to make sense of it, you already get a better sense of which are the states that have higher prevalence and which are the states that have lower prevalence and maybe how each state have changed over time. But again, these have the Alabama fallacy. So the next step you want to do, you want to reorder, okay? So the way you reorder in statistics, there is a lot of ways and it's called generally seri seriation. But the way I have reordered here is with a cluster, hierarchical cluster and I have a, a dendrogram. And now just the reordering can tell you a lot that you would have never seen in the first table, even the color table. You have some states here with low prevalence, although maybe increasing a little bit, some states here with high prevalence throughout all the years, and then some states here that maybe have increased from 2000 all the way to 2010 with prevalence. I have also added the dendrogram because this allows you to kind of see which are the states that are more similar and which are the states that are less similar. And this, I think, uh, allows you to understand a little bit the data. Here I have zoomed in a little bit on the image, and you can see that this family here are states in which the prevalence of asthma have always been high. They have not changed between 2000 and 2010. You can see that by the scholar schema and by the position of the states. And then you can go here and you can see this may belong to a whole family or you can divide it in, in subfamilies, but maybe this family here of states from Nevada, Virginia, Maryland, Utah, Colorado, Illinois, Idaho, and Kansas, those states are states that I think, because this may not be the best graph to answer that question, but to my eyes that where the prevalence have increased throughout those 10 years. So this is a way to move from a table into still a table, but a table that already provides you some context in order for you to understand the data better and to communicate the findings in a better way. What people do a lot, and I have some examples later in the talk, is to do a map. So what you do is uh, you have your 50 states, continental states, and you just draw uh, the prevalence in a map because people are very, generally, people are good knowing where the states are located in the US map. So what you can see is starting in 2000, the prevalence of asthma was 7.3, and you can see as we move along in the years, we start getting redder and red, meaning that the prevalence at the end of 2010 is 9.1, and it has increased uh, or remained constant in a lot of the states. This difference almost of 2% between uh, these uh, 11 years. And again, I use the same scale, and this is very easy for, uh, to be able to communicate the results with an investigator. I just want to make sure that people understand. I have here just done a little bit of, uh, just plot only two, stay, uh, two years, you know, 20, uh, 2000 and 2010, and you know you, I can highlight a little bit the increase in prevalence. Now, this is almost a 2% increase in prevalence. I went, I did a little bit the math. This is five million extra cases of asthma in these last 10 years throughout the United States. And that does not even include maybe the increase in population. But this is an epidemic, it's happening, and we are seeing it here, in my opinion, clearly displayed, although not the best way. And now we move to the next. This is um, something that have caught on. Sorry. Yes. Um, just for my information, how, 
how were the levels chosen for the change in color? OK, that's an excellent question. And there is a lot of literature on that. I have just to, uh, chosen quantile. So there is the same number of uh, states n in each of these cells. But uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion on which is the best way. It can be linear. It can be nonlinear. I just did a non-parametric uh, selection here. Now, uh, this is uh, what I find very smart idea, you know, and it's called the small multiples, you know, and it's catching up a lot. Or maybe it already caught and I just learned it. But <laughs> anyway, it had, it had caught a lot. And this is the idea that in order for you to be able to compare, we statisticians do everything. Everything we do is to compare. You know, we compare a treatment, we compare a placebo. So in order for you to compare, you need to fit as much data as you can in one page. But you need to fit the data in one page that makes sense, you know, you just cannot fit anything, you know. So what this does, it is shows you the uh, prevalence of asthma in each state, you know. And let me highlight this because I've seen this done all the time, but I've seen it done all the time wrong. Because you see me repeating the axis, there is no point on repeating the axis in each panel. The axes are shared. So you can just see it here and here. That's all you need to know if you want to make a comparison between states. And what you can see, again, here we go, Alabama fallacy. Starting from Alabama, going all the way to Wyoming. And I have add here in a different color for you, because this is not easy to do it in a map. I have add what is the nationwide prevalence in the United States in the increase of asthma throughout those years. And what you can see is that you can start comparing, and you can start making some inferences about this data. This is good, but it can be better. And you know, you may think this is hard, and it's just not. It's not hard because I can do it, so it cannot be very hard. And I can show you here the code. The code says, I want an xy plot, you know, so I want the prevalence in the y-axis, the year in the x-axis. I want it condition on the state, so I want each panel to be a state. The data is this data set, the, the behavioral risk uh, survey. I want points, lines, and grid lines. Points, line, and grid lines. Notice that the grid lines are there as a detail. They are not there as Excel, just in your face, you know, to uh, make it harder to understand. And then uh, we have the group. The group, I just use it here for states versus, versus nationwide. And then I have the color. These are the colors that I use, black, red for nationwide, and, and black for states. And I label the axis. This is all what you need to do to get the previous figure. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, you can also do this now in SAS with SQ. Yeah, yeah, this is, I, I just want to make sure, I'm, I, this is not an issue about software. But I don't see it done. So that's the question. I, this is a, a, a talk about illustration, illustrating graphics. Whatever tool you use and can do it, do it. But just do it. So what we do again is we just get away from the Alabama fallacy and we reorder the data. I have ordered here the data. There is a lot of ways you can reorder the data, but the most important, I think, for any person looking at this data is to reorder the data accordingly to the slopes, meaning this is the state that has the highest slope, meaning it has increased the most throughout those last 11 years in the prevalence of asthma. And it goes all the way to the bottom where you have West Virginia that has remained flat throughout the years. Now, this is good. If you do this, I will be happy. But you can do better. What you can do is put a little bit of context in the figure, you know, to help the investigator. So what I have done here is I have done in each panel a statistical analysis to know if that prevalence has changed or not throughout the years. And what you can see is I have color-coded the background of the panel 
to relate that information. So depending on the p-value of that slope increase, I have color-coded the background. So all the states except six have seen a statistically significant increase in the prevalence of asthma in these last 11 years. And uh, I find it telling, you know, and I think this adds a little bit of context that is just hard to get from the previous one where you don't have the statistical analysis done behind the scenes. And then finally, what I do in the next figure is I just, I'm just telling you maybe for the, to, to, to please the eyes, I left a little bit more space between the panels for nationwide like that people can focus if they need to focus on that. So, you know, I told you a little bit about lattice, about small panels, they are all over. Why they're all over? Because they are useful. Here, somebody have uh, used the small panel technique to uh, plot uh, movie posters that have a similar theme, you know, and this is the theme of two people uh, sharing their back, you know? <laughs> but you see it all. You know, if I put one of these in each page, maybe it makes sense, but you just can't compare. When you put them all in the same page, you can compare. The other thing that I want to remark is that the colors, you know, I mean, I have my favorite colors. I'm sure you have your favorite colors. They are nice, we like them, but they, they may not be the best to, to display statistics, you know? And what people have done, and this is uh, very, actually a lot of people in geography have worked in this area, you know? And what people have done is they have come with palettes, they're called palettes of color, that have optimal properties, you know? And I have only displayed a few here of those palettes. This palette is called divergent, when you want to show uh, a correlation going from minus one to one, it's divergent. You know, the positive may be one gamma of colors, the negative another ones, and rarely you should see the zero as a white. White is a bad choice. And then you have um, continuous colors, just as I have, because uh, there is a, a continuum in the prevalence of asthma from low to high, and then more importantly, you have these colors that are called qualitative because you want to represent data that does not have an ordering such as gender, you know? And I think the worst color you can choose is red, you know? So because red and black always give you the tendency to appear larger than what they are. And you know, this, uh, uh, this I, I put the link here if you want to play with these colors, these color schemes can be photocopy and you can still see the gradient. It can be projected, and you can still see the gradient. It can be used in a computer monitor, and you still see the gradient. If you are um, colorblind, certain of these palettes may work, etc. And you know, it's called a color brewer, because I think it's an analogy to beer, maybe. You know, brewer, color. So, uh, uh, there is somebody that put this in a SAS macro if you wanted to use in your own graphics. And you know, finally, I, I, one of the things I want to highlight is, you know, uh, we don't do this just for the fun of doing nice pictures, you know? These go to publications. And the investigators, what I found throughout all these years that I've been working with investigators, they are very persistent about having the figure the way they like it, you know? And oftentimes, the way they like it is the way it makes sense. And it's because a figure is very important to represent the results, you know? And they want to show their work and a, a people being able, in general, what they want is people to copy the figure and put it in a PowerPoint because that gets done a lot. So they want to choose good colors, they want to choose a lot of good things like that, that's possible. And this is some of the work we have done in the last 10 years, 10 years, no, in the last two years, where we have used figures to represent statistical results. So now that we have moved uh, away from um, uh, the prevalence, I'm going to show you a little bit of some work we have done in other areas, you know, of asthma, and how we have uh, illustrated those results with graphics. The NHANES is a na na National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. It's a large survey that is done very, is done uh, constantly as a matter of fact. 
And in 2005 and 2006, Ro, in cooperation with the NIEID and the National Institute of Health and Environmental Sciences, put together a panel or, or a, a, a set of questionnaires to be asked in this way, this call a wave of 506. And what, what they ask us to do is to analyze the data, and what they actually did is they, they did a blood marker of allergy that is called the specific IgE. So when you measure your blood, you can actually detect if you have these specific IgEs in your blood, and then that's a marker of if you are allergic to that uh, allergen or not. Uh, now, we have a lot of data because we have 19 specific IgEs, so 19, to simplify, think of 19 uh, uh, allergy prevalences, you know, for the individual. And then we have a lot of variables, you know. And the first thing they want to know is, how is the prevalence for these uh, allergy biomarkers different by socio-demographics socio variables? And this is the figure we have put together for them. I'm sure any statistician looking at this can realize that this may be 200, if not more, pages of SAS output. Now, I can send it to 200 pages of output, but it's, uh, it's worthless. You know, they want to see the picture, they want to see the big message. And what we have here, if we have the first column, shows the overall, and these specific IGs are often divided in categories. You have a category for the foods, a category for the indoor, a category for the outdoors, and these are the 19. And then in, in, within those categories, uh, you derive a variable that is, are you allergic to any of those foods, any of those indoors, any of those outdoors? And you can see here the first column, I, I, I uh, a plot with a bar chart the prevalences. Notice that they are somehow ordered, you know, I don't plot, uh, the, the, I, I use a certain ordering. And then the next, I look at gender. Now this was going to be photocopy, and if you want this to be photocopy, you need to use different symbols, you know? So here, I think I have used the square for the females and the one for the, and the circles for the males. And uh, uh, all the way, race, education, poverty index, and level of urbanization. And what I have done to enhance a little bit the understanding of this graphic is I have filled the dots of the triangles or the squares depending if they're statistically significant or not. So for example, you can see by gender, there is no difference in egg or milk, but you can see there is differences for all the other foods for all the indoors except for mouse and for all the outdoors. And uh, I can highlight a few of them, but what is interesting when you look at this, this is interesting because for us, the prevalence, we study a lot uh, inner city asthma. And we study inner city asthma because the prevalence of cockroach allergen is higher in the inner city. And you can see right away that the only one significant is German roach for the indoor allergens. This is very satisfying somehow, maybe to me, not to you. But. So if, you, if, if uh, 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 these pictures can be zoomed in, and it remains the same quality, zoom out. Here, what I have done is I zoom in. Here you have gender, and you can see a little bit the difference by gender for the indoor and outdoor allergens. And you have race, and the race, I think the blue ones were the non-Hispanic blacks, and you can see the prevalence for the non-Hispanic blacks is larger for the majority of the indoor and outdoor figures. And uh, it takes work to do this. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it takes a little bit of work to do this. But when you go to a conference call that lasts one hour, you can show this, and this takes two minutes to understand, two minutes and a half if you are slow, and then you can spend the 55 other minutes talking about content about where you should analyze the data, what are the next analyses that are important, et cetera. We do the same here with age, you know, 
H has more categories, so it's a little bit harder to fit it in that uh, in those panels. But here are the categories of H, and what you can see is the prevalence of H throughout the years. And what happens often with allergy is allergy tends to peak between 20 and 40, and then after that it decreases. And it tends to happen for all the allergens. And you can see that especially for the indoors and mostly the outdoors that happen. I'm allergic to cat, but cat remains at, at least until I'm 80. I'm going to be allergic to cat following this data. You know, and then again, I have done a little bit of statistical analysis and I have done a few trend tests. And the only one where the prevalence of allergy does not change is with rats and probably because it's a very low prevalence. And here I have zoomed in on that same image just to give you an idea that how, uh, how uh, the prevalence changed uh, uh, over the age of the participants. But more so, you know, there is some aesthetics. I mean, that at least they are important to me, you know. And the aesthetic is these are marginal. This is any of those that we are in the right-hand side. And what you do is put a little bit more space, give the individual the idea that they are talking about two different things. One is the marginals, the other one is the other ones. So that provides a little bit of context. Now, we have talked about the prevalence of, of, uh, of those uh, aller allergies, you know, in the US population. And what we do next is a lot of these things seems to happen together, you know? If you are allergic to cat, you are likely to be allergic to dog, although I'm not allergic to dog, so I don't fit. <laughs> uh, and what we do is these are correlation metrics. Any statistician has seen this. You print this in SAS. It takes five or six pages. Before I knew this, I used to go to my office, you know, and I used to cut the paper, and with tape, I used to put it together in a big table just as this and trying to look and understand where the pattern is. And that's good, but you can do better. You know, so what we do here is we put the correlation metrics together in the, you label uh, the rows and the columns with those allergens, and a correlation metrics for you that don't know is symmetric. So you always get the same in the top triangle that in the bottom triangle. So because there is no point on repeating the numbers twice, in the top triangle I actually put the correlations, and because zero point doesn't mean anything, because they are all zero point, you know, I just delete them, and I just focus on the two numbers. And since all these are positive, I can use a scale that is a, a continuous and not divergent. This would have been positive and negative, I would have used a divergent scale. And what I have done, again, is ordering them. So I have ordered them by their degree of association. And I have had a dendrogram just for you to be able to see how those things happen. And what you can see is that you have families, rat and mouse uh, cluster together. So do, that's dog and cat. You know what? In the beginning, they may be all the four correlated together. And then you go and you look at shrimp and cockroach clustering together. Their P and their F, these are two dust mites. These are very highly correlated. You see they start very soon. And this correlation is 90, uh, 0.97. And you can see that. And this represents that. And then you have all these clusters here that are clusters of trees, you know. And they all cluster together. And you can also see it in the metrics happening. And then you have our moles, Aspergillus and Alternaria, and, and you have milk and egg. And probably milk and egg is one of the weakest that is correlated between themselves. And I, and I, I think with this data, you can see right away a little bit the story. Now, it takes a little bit of work, you know, but I think it's, um, it's uh, valuable in the sense that right away you have a little bit of context in which you analyze the data. And the context uh, by which you want to analyze this data, if they, at the very least, you know that you cannot put their P and their F in the same model. They are collinear, so the model will uh, statistically explode. So uh, uh, 
what we do for that is we develop some cluster analysis and we cluster those uh, uh, allergens that are uh, uh, very similar to each other. And we those, after we did the cluster analysis, we get a rodents, a plants, a pets, a mold, a foods, a dust mite, and then a cockroach and shrimp. Cockroach and shrimp are very correlated because they share a lot of the same uh, uh, traits, amazingly enough. You should think of that the next time you eat a shrimp, <laughs> you know? And uh, what we do here is this is now we have moved of the correlation between those two, between the allergens, and we look how are those allergens related to asthma, okay? And what we get here is we get a model that is unadjusted, we get a model that is adjusted, we get the individuals here, and we get the clusters here. So this is also a lattice plot, you know, because all the data is here. So you can start doing comparisons. Uh, uh, for the individual, uh, I have uh, put two lines here. This is the unity line. So if the odds ratio does not cross that line, it's statistically significant. And if it cross that line, it's not statistically significant. And I have done the same for clusters. And what you can see is that they are all positively associated with asthma. And for the clusters, the same way. And what I have done once again is actually not only use the line, the crossing of the line, but I have also filled the dots if they are statistically significant or not. And you can see the only one that is not statistically significantly associated with asthma is rat when you adjust it for some socioeconomic uh, sociodemographics factors. And uh, 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 for the rest, they are all positive, and you have the confidence intervals, and you can interpret a little bit this data. I think sometimes when you get uh, multivariate data, you know, it's, it's all the more important to be careful of how you are going to plot it, because you want to uh, before you make a synthesis of the data, you really want to look at a lot of the individual uh, uh, variables. Now, these examples that I'm going to show you now, this is from our Eureka um, uh, cohort study. It's the Urban Environmental and Childhood Asthma, and it's an observational prospective study. And the goal of this study is just to look how the environmental factors early in life, in the first few years, affect how your uh, uh, cytokine responses, your immune development works, and how those changes affect the likelihood that you will be uh, asthmatic, asthmatic or allergic. And uh, when we do those type of analysis, uh, 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 if you have worked with immunology data, you know you get a lot of data. I mean, actually, you get a lot of data all the time. But in immunology, you get a little bit more. So what you get is you get cytokines. And I'm not going to go through the detail, but the idea is that you get cytokine. And each cytokine is stimulated with different stimulants. And one of the things that we do earlier on, especially in a cohort study such as this one, is to quality control the data. And what we ask a lot of the labs, we ask them, you do one time. You send us the data, you redo it again, you send us the data, we are going to see if what you are measuring is, what is, is, uh, is in agreement to what you have measured. And uh, this figure uh, shows that. And you have seen maybe uh, this is similar to other figures that I have shown. But you have replicate A in this axis, replicate B in this axis, and you have the cytokines by the stimulants. And since we are looking at agreement, <laughs> agreement gets measured by a lot of uh, uh, statistics. But one statistic that we use is the concordant correlation coefficient. And what that is, is if the, the, the points are measured uh, a perfect agreement. Every point should follow on that line, meaning you get the same results for replicate A as you do for replicate B. And the departure from that line is disagreement. 
So what I have done here is I have plotted them all together, and we have actually a superimposed the child cytokine and the mother cytokine, just to see if we get different agreements for the child and for the mother. And something that happens very often in immunological data or with a lot of data sets is you have what is called overplotting. You know, I mean, a lot of points follow exactly in the same place. And what you do when you have overplotting, you can do a lot of things. But one of the things that you can do, not with Windows, but with other programs, not with Windows files, but is what is called alpha blending. So if you have five points that fall exactly on top of each other, they become darker. That's what alpha blending is, is called, and, and this has alpha blending. And uh, uh, you can see, you put them all in a small panels, and you can start seeing the story now. That actually was communicated to me when I showed this figure by the investigator. I didn't figure out the story by myself. But what is happening is uh, I have color-coded the background again, depending on the level of agreement. If they are white, they are agreeing more than if they are darker. And what happens, this here is a zoom-in version of that. So this is two cytokines, uh, IF and gamma and alpha. And you can see here the diagonal line and how the points f uh, uh, fall outside that diagonal line. And what the investigator was telling me, that actually when I look back at the figure, it makes sense is that the agreement is dependent on the level of detection. Because when you have the points following higher on the agreement line, there is less level of detection. So you tend to, to get a much better agreement than when the points start falling down. And when they fall down, they arrive to this area. And here, they are all maybe at the level of detection but one was just a little bit below and the other one a little bit above. And that's happening here. That's why the agreement is so poor. And what you can see at the whole picture and when you color code it, you can just get that message or you can, you, maybe you don't get the message. Maybe somebody else looking at that will communicate to you the message. I think that's, if there is a lesson to be learned is we don't know everything by, by plotting and displaying this in one piece of paper and giving that to the investigator, we get the message back. You know, this have been, I actually want to look for this. And this is a Venn diagram. We all learn this. I don't know in this country when you learn it, but we learn it very early in Argentina. You know, and often when you do probabilities, you learn it. And this have been invented in 1890, OK? And they are still in use today. But uh, I'm going to show you an example of how we can improve them. You know, on the Venn diagram, uh, in this case, is you have three outcomes, with eczema and positive IgE that is allergy. And the investigator, the first thing, when you have several outcomes, the first thing, and I guarantee you that any investigator is going to ask you is how many people have two, how many people have one, how many people have the three outcomes, etc. And the investigators told us to do this. And we did the Venn diagram. And then he says, no, no, no. This Venn diagram doesn't work for me. What I want the Venn diagram is to be proportional to how many people are in each cell, because that is the true display of the data. And you know, lo and behold, I went, I found it, and there is an algorithm that does just that. And as far as I understand the paper, there is a solution for three or four groups regardless of which percents you find. So what it shows you is it shows you that this is 51%, and now the, the intersection between WIS and eczema is 17%, and the intersection between all the three is 11%, and each of these percent and each color, this is a, a represented truly in this figure. Now, this is what I was telling you about alpha blending. This has alpha blending because it has a transparency. So you see how the colors change depending on where you are? That's easy to do, you know, but you need to know how to do it. And what it, it, it tells you is, generally when you plot figures, it's called the painter's paradigm. And the painter's paradigm, what it is, is tell you when you plot something, you plot something on top of that, it gets covered. So this is not the painter's paradigm. This is an alpha blending paradigm. And what it does is it disowns 
it blends the three colors together. So I think it's pleasing for the eye and actually is the correct way to do it. Uh, now, this is an analysis and I say uh, it's, a, it's just a, not a simple analysis, but it's an analysis that we do often where they ask us, show us the association between recurrent wheeze and allergic uh, allergies for uh, each of the years in which we collected cytokine, okay? So each of the years we collected cytokines are in different panels, and each of the outcomes are in different panels here. And what they say is, is actually this is kind of a nice story because the investigator draw us this in a piece of paper and told us this is how I want you to show me the results. And we took it, we went, we developed it, here it is. And what it is, is it's showing you each tile, these are actually sometimes called tile plots, each tile represents an odd ratio. And the odd ratio is, if, for example, let me take this one, LPS with IFN, uh, uh, this is alpha. Now, you don't need to know exactly the odds ratio because you can go to the key and know that the odds ratio is between 1.25 and 2.5. And then if it's statistically significant or marginally significant, we actually put the p-value in there. And we actually not only put the p-values, but we put a little border in the tile. And what the investigator wanted to know is if certain patterns will start appearing, you know, and when you look at a lot of SAS output or any output for that matter, it takes a long time to figuring out if a pattern is showing up. And here you can see a little bit going out in birth, not much, not much going out in the first year, but a lot of things start happening in the third year. A lot of positive things start happening in the third year. And in particular, you have IFN gamma, regardless if this is significant or not, this is an IFN gamma effect. You have also an IL-12P40 effect. And you can overlay these when you do other tiles, allergic allergens, you know? And this just shows you how you put a lot of results together and you are focusing a little bit more on the pattern than on the individual lot ratio by itself. When we look at allergic aeroallergen, we don't see much happening in the third year, but you see a little bit of the contradictory effects here of CPG stimulants happening IL-gamma, IL-12, P40, and IL-8. Although contradictory because some are positive, some are negative. And you see this? This is the use of a divergent scale because the odds ratio, if they are below one, they are negative. If they are above one, they are positive. And this is a lot of data, and I think represents quite well uh, when you work with a lot of data and you can make sense if you're looking a little bit more for a pattern starting to show up that individual odds ratio. Now I'm going to move to the Maria example. I think you have seen this in the old company meeting, and I'm not going to do the rotating uh, things again, but I'm going to go with a little bit more time into how we build from beginning to end the figures that actually, all of the figures that are shown here, or the majority, went to the manuscript, okay? Uh, this was work that was done by uh, Herman and Sam Arbs, and uh, we received this data set, 3,200, uh, 3, uh, 32,616 observations, and they wanted to know if they can, if they have a good method to measure the agreement within a laboratory and between laboratories. And there were nine laboratories in the US and uh, Europe, then a Aplex array, and these are the ones that we, they measure, 151 aliquots and three separate measurements. And I will show you each of these uh, with a figure coming up. And the investigator told us, are, are we there, are we not there? And I'll show you how we did it. So, the first thing that we're going to look is at the intra-lab agreement. What this means is I give you 155 aliquots. I give it to you. I say measure them, you measure. I give them, them to you again. I ask you to measure them a second time and I see how many of those 
we are in agreement, meaning how much agreement there is. So again, we have a unity line. If the points fall only in the unity line, that means that there is a perfect agreement. We measure that with what is called the concordance correlation coefficient, confidence interval there. So each lab did three runs. So what I'm showing here you is for blood G, so the cockroach allergen, lab A, run two versus run one. And you can see the agreement that exists. Now we have more than two runs, we have three runs. So the next step we can do is we can do every pairwise comparison. So we do lab a run one versus two, one versus three, and two versus three. And this is for lab A, each of those runs. The agreement was 0 0.95, 0 0.96, 0 0.97. And here are the figures, all sharing the same axis, etc. Another example of the small multiples. So this is a good agreement, depending on what it's a good is always a relative term, you know, but it's a good agreement between for lab A for the blood G allergen for those first for those three runs. And when you have data like this, you can make a little cube. This is actually worked very well because you cannot make a cube if you will have four runs. You know, so was they did three runs, so we could make a cube, but so what you do now is you have a, a, the, the, the line of, of unity in a three-dimensional space. So how the points fall away from that line and the agreement is 0.96. Now, that's for lab A for black G. Now we go next. To all, the la to all the allergens for that, no, for all the labs for that same allergen. And what, you ca what I have done is this is the one we just saw, and I have added them. Again, look at the small multiples. Now you can start making comparisons, but I help him with the comparisons because if the agreement was a little bit low, I actually color coded. So you can see that Black G was excellent for all the labs but not so good for lab G, okay? And now what we can do is we can do one more step and we add all the allergens and you can start comparing now. And I ha again, I have uh, helped them a little bit because I have color coded all the ones that are below 0.9. But in general, the intra-lab agreement is excellent, except for a few cases here and there. And I highlight lab G for blood G, and you have for DER P, you have lab F, etc. And this one is an interesting one. There, there is only three or four points. I'm sure they, they made a mistake when they, uh, for the transcription, you know, when they were typing. But we went back to the lab, and they promised they didn't make a mistake. But the data doesn't lie, yeah? The lab may. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so here you have the intra-lab agreement. I'm going to ask you to remember a number here. We say this was 0.96, okay? Lab A, blood G, okay? You remember that one? 0.96. So now what we do is we move to the inter-lab agreements. So now we have one lab, lab A, another lab, lab D. Lab A did three times, ran the, the assay three times. Lab D, D ran it three times two. And there is a total of nine pairwise comparisons that can happen. And again, using the lattice, I have done this here. You have Lab D run one versus Lab A run one. And you can see here that uh, uh, the agreement that exists. And I have done this for all the possible comparisons. And you can see here that I have added the key. This is, uh, this is neither a, con this is a divergent, although maybe a continuous would have been better here. Anyway, I, I did a divergent and I color coded. So you can see right now, without looking much at the data, just looking at the colors, that lab D run one is suspicious. Or maybe not suspicious, it's not as good as the agreement that you got with run two and run three. Okay, and because it's always happening in this column, you know that the problem may have come from lab D run one. 
OK? So remember this color pattern, OK? Very darker, clearer, OK? So the next step we are going to do is we have a lot of data, because I will have a lot of comparisons between labs and runs, you know? Uh, and this is how we plot the data. We get each of the allergens in the columns and each of the labs in the rows. And the one I was looking was a lab A, was a lab A for blood G that was the first one. And the one when I average all those agreements, this is the data point that I was plotting with those nine graphs. Okay? So you can see from the larger picture that what you see is dog, perfect, does mite, perfect, fell deep, pretty good if not perfect, mite, perfect, mouse, perfect, rat, not so good. You see? They're varying a lot. Notice how I use the same axis here. Otherwise, you won't be able to see that if you use different graph, a different axis. And black G is questionable. But what you start seeing is there's a lot of A's happening here. You see that? A lot of A's. And the one with test is lab A with D is, is D, there. So then we go, um, we can go to the next step. But I, I, I just want, to, I ask you to remember 0.96 and I ask you to remember the color pattern, okay? So how we put everything together in a figure? You do this, or this is what I did, okay? So I told you 0.96 to remember, okay? Because 0.96 is the agreement that exists within the lab. So within the labs is the diagonal. I have actually made the colors white to make it a little bit easier to see. And you can see that lab A, the diagonal is the intra-lab agreement. Here it is, lab A with itself. They did three runs. We averaged the three runs. This is the number we don't got. Then I told you to look at the color pattern of the inter-lab agreement. And we were uh, working of a comparison between A and D. So here is A, here is D. You see this pattern? This is exactly the pattern we saw in the other one, because it's actually the same data. But what you see is there was a problem with run one for lab G, and the other ones were good. OK? So what you can see is you have excellent agreement, except for lab G maybe, a little bit there, but excellent intra-lab agreement. And you have almost excellent interlab agreement. But something happened with lab A and maybe with lab G. All the other ones have excellent, except for one here and there. It won't happen. When we show this data to the investigators, they say, no, this cannot happen. This is impossible. So what they went, they went, they did analysis, and they did some labs, and you know, and they told us, this is what we figured out. Lab for cockroach, and I will show you then why it happens only for cockroach. For cockroach, the distance to which you ship the extract affects the outcome. That's why it doesn't affect within the lab, because the labs are always measuring against their own extract, but it affects between labs. And this was the originator lab. And this was a lab that was very close. This was very close. This was an European lab. And these were labs throughout the United States that were a lot farther. This happens in life only once. You know, I mean, uh, such, a, you know such a rewarding uh, uh, answer you know, from a graphic. But you know, I told you, lattice, what do you want to do in lattice in small multiples? You want to make a lot of comparisons. So what do you do next? You put it everything together. So here you have all the allergens, and you have the same thing happening. I forgot you to tell you that what I did here is in the diagonal, the intralab agreement. The bottom diagonal, I, I allow each of the pairwise comparisons between uh, the interlab agreement. And what I did here, because it's always symmetrical, I actually put the average. So. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. 
they're all asleep now. So <laughs> the, all these yeah, um, so all these numbers average 2.72. So that's what I did. You know, just if you don't want to actually look at every pairwise comparison. And what you get here is when you put everything together, the more data, the better it is. You know, and what you see is you see there is perfection. I mean, almost perfection. You can pick up a few here or may, uh, with the rat, although the rat is still good. And this is the problem. And this is why they went back and they did, redid it. OK? I'm uh, very proud of this one, you know? Did it make sense? OK. So what we do next is I'm going to show you a few examples from our um, weight studies. You know, asthma has a lot of association with weight. And we have um, done studies just to understand that influence on the symptoms in a very well uh, followed population. So the first figure that we do is that we do a figure in which we show the relationship we show the relationship between height and months. And if you have kids, or if you remember when you were a kid, uh, you go to the pediatrician, you know, and they have these charts. Because your weight by itself is irrelevant. What is important is your age, your age, you know, or your height is irrelevant by itself. You know, a two-year-old is always going to be shorter than a six-year-old. You know, so what they use, they use percentiles. And let me highlight this for you. So here we have the height. Here we have the age in months. Notice this. Same axis, but here I plot it in inches. Here I plot it in centimeters. Okay? And what you can see is this is the population of males. This is the population of females. And what I have overplot here, subtle, is the percentiles. This is the 95th percentile, 90th percentile, the median, 10th and 5th percentile. And I, I give you an example. This person is short for his age, but this person has the same height, but he's tall. So that's why the actual axes that you want to plot are not these ones, but are actually what is happening inside. And you can now see certain things. I use the same scale. So you can see that men, on average, are taller than women, especially when they're younger. And you can see that because the pink dots, I chose pink for men, pink for women, <laughs> blue for men. And uh, uh, although there is no need of color here, because the panel already tell you where you are, that was just an aesthetic uh, uh, decision of mine. And it gives you, this gives you already a lot of information. And I think this is uh, useful for uh, assessing what is happening. You have this person here, you know, that you may want to go and check, make sure that that's true. You have this person here that you may want to go and check, or he may be playing for the Celtics, I don't know. So, uh, uh, this, uh, I don't know if I did justice to the figure, but I get, you get the idea. Now, when we collect data, we, in our studies, we often follow these kids for a year, a year and a half. And we collect data on them co uh, continuously, you know, every month, every two months. And, and one of the data sets, that one of the things that we always collect is height, weight, and age. You know, although age, we don't collect it because we know it. And what we have done, this is, we have done this a lot for um, a quality control, mostly. OK? And I'm, I'm going to explain you this figure. And what you have here is you have the BMI plotted, but the axes are the weight with the heights. The BMI is a transformation of weight by height. And I have ordered these panels from more to less not to get into the Alabama fallacy. So this person was the person that, on average, was the heaviest in our study. And then this goes for several pages, you know, and I just put here the first page. And then I have color in the background areas to which uh, where 
you are classified as your BMI. If you are below 16.5, you are considered uh, underweight. So it's actually if you are 18.5, but then your uh, pediatrician wants us all to be between 18.5 and 25. If you are between 25 and 30, it's, uh, it's not as good, and it goes as, mm, as bad. You know, the worst is here. Now, notice how I, this I maybe I didn't highlight in the previous figure, but notice how I did the, how I did the, the, the axis. I'm not plotting an arbitrary number there. This is the maximum BMI we got in the study. This is the minimum BMI I got in our study, you know? So we're already I'm providing you some information just by the way I do the levels that is hard to get otherwise. And then you can see a little bit the patterns, but let me highlight on a few of them. Here are three individuals, two of which have a similar pattern. This person, this was the height, this was the weight. This person, let me say it sadly, have not gained any weight, any height in our study, but have increased their weight consistently throughout any of those visits. Now, this person have increased a little bit their height, but still, the weight increase have been disproportionately to their height increase. And then you have this person here that have increased their height and weight in a proportionally ma manner. So that's why they remain always, except for the last visit, they remain always on the same BMI range. So I told you earlier that we do this for um, mostly for uh, uh, to please our eyes now. Uh, we do this mostly to quality control because when you look at longitudinal, if you have a point here, you know you need to go back. You know it's come like this, it does like this, and it goes up like that. You know that you need to go back to your data and double check that individual. Uh, now, I told you a lot about what we have been doing with some examples that are easy to understand. I want to tell you a little bit about what is coming. What are the things that we are working next? The first thing I want to tell you is about uh, this Jeremy Wildfire that is working on making, making an interactive graph. So we have 20 to 25 years of history of asthma variables collected on individuals, thousands of studies, you know? And what we want to do is to make that data available to the general public. And we wanted to make it, when I say we, I mean Jeremy. I'm just talking for him, but. So uh, 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 we want to make that data available to the public and it's somehow interactive. Like that, the, the general public or the clinicians or the investigators can have access to that data. And this is our first pass to this data set. So here we have, a, it's called the Allergy Explorer, and we have sites. We have different allergens. We have different tests. We talk about the Ig. The Ig is the one that is a blood biomarker. And the skin test is the one where they prick you, and then they see how big that wheel is. And the bigger the wheel, the more allergic you are to that allergen. And then standard cut points, you know, everything is in a continuum from low to more, you know, in, in skin tests it's from zero all the way to 12 millimeters. And in a specific IG, it can go all the way to 100. Uh, the level of detection is 0.35. And what we do with this is we just allow the investigator to interact with the graphic. <coughs> So we do IGs, we do the prevalence of alternaria in our size, the prevalence of cockroach, and now we can go only to black, Hispanics, this is all the data. But if you want to look at one in particular, you will unclick the one you are not interested in. And further enough, you have a summary table that shows you that shows you the, uh, the statistics for uh, those selections that you have made. And uh, I think if, uh, if you change for his 
those percents change. And then furthermore, since we want to make this data public, we actually have the actual numbers that comp are, are composed those percents. So this is coming, this is good, this is the future. The other thing that we are working on, and this is, um, Google is everywhere, you know, but Google is also with the graphics, you know, when they are developing a lot of engines for you to be able to create graphics and allow those <coughs> graphics, you to interact with those graphics. And this is an example of something that uh, we've been looking at. We haven't yet uh, applied it for, um, for uh, asthma research, but I have an example here with another data set that is publicly available. I have here in the axis the life expectancy and in, in the y axis and the x axis I have the fertility. And this allows you to interact with the data. I'm going to choose Argentina, obviously. So, and then I'm going to let it play. And this is, is trailing and you can see how it has changed throughout the years the relationship between fertility and life expectancy. And the plot, the dots, are proportional to the, to the population. So Argentina doesn't have a lot of uh, habitants. You should be lucky I'm here, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we can do the same for the United States. And we can see how the relationship for the United States between the uh, uh, decrease in fertility and the change in life expectancy. In the United States, it's a lot flatter, you know, because uh, the life expectancy have always been kind of good. You see? So now you can interact, and then you have other options for this figure. You can do bar charts or you can do this. And this shows you the life expectancy uh, that you can transform if you want, the life expectancy, and here you have the years. Let me tell you something very sad. So let's close this. So like here, this is Rwanda. Does the life expectancy during the genocide have dropped from a, a top maybe 45, 45 all the way cut almost in half to 25? And then after the genocide, it has increased all the way to 50. And I think here you have all the two sad cases. I think one is East Timor among them. So that's coming, and then I put there uh, another thing that we're doing is uh, uh, this is uh, some interactive graphics using some JavaScript um, uh, language. The other thing that I hope SAS programmers and people that do tables are here, because this, what I'm going to show you next is the future. You can grab it and use it, or you can ignore it. But if you ignore this, we are going to lose a lot or everything eventually. You know, here is, this is the, uh, the 2010, 2011-2012 uh, uh, Major League Soccer, MLS. You know, and here you have the teams and here are the points. How many people have won? How many games? Uh, uh, how many wins? How many loss? And how many ties? And I'm a soccer fan and I have read these tables since I was five years old, you know, and they change throughout the season, you know. And this provides you some data, but they have absolutely no context, the data. So what you do next is you use what uh, Edward Tufte calls spark lines. In this case, they are not lines, they are bar charts, but I think they're still called spark lines. And this gives you a history of how those points happen. So blue means wins, gray means ties, red means losses. So you don't know who they played, but you know right now the history of how they got to those points. How they got to those points? 
I mean, Los Angeles didn't start well. He actually starts bad, but they have a really good end of the season. Now you look at Salt Lake City, these people may be still being kicking themselves because the last six games, they lost four and they tied two. They probably lost the championship in the last time, in the last season, in the last few games. Now this provides you context. This allows you already to see a story that the numbers do not provide you. Then I have a last thing of what uh, we are working. We don't get a lot of geographical data, but we get some. And when I get some geographical data, I want to do justice to the geographical data. This is a map of the 2004 US presidential elections. And I can tell you it's actually a conspiracy from the Republicans to have chosen red, because red looks bigger, OK? But here you have uh, the how, the, how the election was, uh, was uh, won, in this case, by Bush. And he was won 51% to 48%. And you look at this map and you say, no, either he robbed a second election or <laughs> he uh, something is wrong. But something is wrong because the geography is not the unit by which you elect a president. The unit by which you elect a president is not even the population, is the number of people that go to the electoral college. What people do, do is they distort the map. So now, what you, you have the geographical context. You still have it. In elections, the geographical context is important. But now, you distort the states depending on how many people those states bring to the electoral college. And now, although it's not as disproportionately as before, you can see maybe that the red area seem a little bit larger than the blue in a more proportional way. Then uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some data sets that I have come across and I have uh, used to have some fun. This is how I have fun now. <laughs> I have fun uh, without data, too. You know, so uh, this is, uh, you know, somebody invite me to, um, to one of these uh, uh, Kentucky Derby parties, you know, and they were all uh, there with hats. You know, I don't know. I thought I was the English uh, aristocracy, you know, hats, very well dressed, and I come like this, you know, and <laughs> we were looking at this race, you know, and this race, I, I don't know which year, I think it's a 2000 Kentucky, a 2010 Kentucky Derby, and you know, we were watching the Derby, and people were going crazy, the announcers were going crazy. And they were saying this is the biggest upset in history of the sports. Of the sports, he says. You know when I say, well, let's figure out, you know. So here is the, <laughs> here is the results of the Kentucky Derby in a table. We've seen this all the time. The newspaper put this, or everybody puts this. And somebody actually did a figure in which he put the Kentucky Derby in a figure. And in a figure, the idea is clear that mind that bird was last until the third, fourth quarter. Uh, this must be the third, fourth stretch or something like that, you know? And in no time, he went all the way to first and he won the race. And I don't know how many uh, upsets there are. They tell me that the hockey game between US and Russia back then was an upset also, although I didn't saw it. But this seems quite impressive to me. And I have to tell you that when you look at this, or when you look at this, you get a different story. Now, this is something similar to the Kentucky Derby here. But what I have done is I have taken all the results from the Tour de France in ranks, and I have plotted. And here you have the ranks. The ranks goes from first to 197. And this is the first stage. In the first stage, they just uh, cruise along, so to speak, you know, except some people that actually abandon right away, you know? I mean, I don't know how can that be, because it's like riding around the quadrangle, you know? <laughs> but uh, so this is the first stage as an advertisement stage. And then the race starts. And what you can see right there is, you know, the ranks don't change that much. There is a few times when they change. They change uh, in these two stages. 
and then in this stage and a little bit in here. But after that, they remain the same. Well, let me tell you how the Tour de France happens. You know, the Tour de France happens in stages, and there is stages and stages. There is stages in which people cruise along. Otherwise, you cannot be riding a bicycle for 20 days nonstop, 200 kilometers a day. But there are stages that are called, in, in French, that are called contre la montre, and means against the clock. And what that means is that either you do it by yourself or with your team, and there is nobody around. They tell you, OK, go to the finish line the fastest you can. And there is where a lot of people gain or lose time. And then you have a lot of the stages that are the mountain stages. And you have mountain riders, and you have speed riders. And a lot of the changes in rank are occurring in the mountain stages. This probably is the Alps that are larger mountains than the Pyrenees. But they do both, the Pyrenees and the Alps. And I think I have plot here Contador. Contador is the one that was just in the news for doping. Uh, and uh, you can see how he was throughout the race. He started quite well, and actually he was in the front of the race throughout, uh, throughout um, the Tour de France that year. Then this is another data set that I find fascinating. You know, so, uh, this is a data set of all the flights that occur in the United States on February 2011. Okay? And uh, what you have here is you have American Airlines. And you can see right now, uh, this is, I think, Puerto Rico, and this is uh, Hawaii. And what you can see, I have actually plotted the lines depending on the frequency of flights that happen between those two airports. And the darker they are, or the, the whiter they are, the more flights they are. But if I have a lot of flights, I have, actually, I have made them blue. So what you can see here is Dallas. And you see a lot of flights out of Dallas, OK? Because American flies out of Dallas. You know, maybe you see Chicago there. American airline flies out of, Ameri of, uh, of Chicago. And here you have Southwest, you know? And Southwest, you can see right away a different pattern. Uh, the pattern is there is a lot going on in the Southwest, hence. <laughs> uh, but they fly a little bit everywhere, you know? And I can show you, I, I'm not plotting all of them here, but you can see all the major airlines, all the airlines that went bankrupt, they have this pattern. Southwest has this pattern. And then when I plot everything together, you can now see that uh, you cannot see anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see, you know, you can see Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, maybe New York here. Uh, maybe LA, they are Salt Lake City. You know, it's a little bit harder to see the pattern appearing. But this is what has happened in February 2011 in the United St in the skies of the United States. So uh, there is books, there is references, everything is on my iShare. I have created. Um, you know, when they first told me that I needed to do this presentation, I told them like it's, it's like asking me to choose a child. I mean, they are all, all the graphics, I put a lot of love in them. And I cannot choose one over the other ones. But I have created a, a, a PDF documentation that has, in my iShare, you will see, Actually, the iShare is another example. Why the iShare is sorted alphabetically? It should be sorted by size of people uh, content, you know? So when they delete the iShare, you should point, oh, no, it's because of you. You were the, <laughs> they were the first in the line, you know? <laughs> so there goes another fallacy. So I, ca I have put uh, the Viz library here. This has all the, the, all the figures that we have added uh, to our, our uh, visualization library. And each figure, there is like 150 figures here, OK? I cannot have 150 child children. But, uh, and then I have done here, the this library, each of those figures that are labeled in the bottom with the location and the name, each of the figures have um, a, has a, let me go. For example, let me go to that. Table. Each of the figures have a, prog have a PDF. I have to actually do a lot of the figures in wide format to be able to display here. So 
we saw the tables today, the ASMA tables, and then each one has a data set where you get the data set to do this really reproducible. You have a documentation, the figure, if there is a function, but most importantly, there is a program that goes step by step into how to create that figure. And uh, there is a lot of figures down here in R, but if there is figures in SAS, you will see the figure in SAS. And then I also created, uh, in my iShare, I put a, a book resources, web resources, books that I recommend, and actually one, two of them are available here if you want them, and then articles, ar articles that go into the details of, uh, of um, uh, this one is, f for example, about the selection color that I was discussing earlier, you know? And uh, it goes into why certain colors are more appropriate than other ones, how to choose them, etc. And then uh, uh, that you can investigate, you can come, ask questions, and... Uh, then... That's it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.